All right. Um, we are uh, today going to present some work that we've done uh, related to cost efficiency. We had a, a, our colleagues present uh, some other broader arc of, of what we've been doing. This specifically focuses on uh, introducing high density storage uh, within Uber and how we uh, managed to work, work with IO utilization to be able to, to support high density storage and what the opportunity there was. Before I get started, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm Ekant. I'm an engineer on the Uber Data team. I work on data, data infra challenges at Uber. I'll let Leon introduce himself before we jump in. Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Leon, and uh, I'm also working on data, uh, uh, Uber's data infrastructure, uh, mostly on the HFS end. All right, so um, start with Uber's mission. We uh, are a company that ignites opportunity by setting the world in motion. We move people and things and connect them with opportunity um, along the way. Just to give a sense of uh, what Uber as a uh, business is and, and uh, where, where we are, uh, we are a global company. We operate in six continents, 71 countries, and in about 10,000 cities uh, across the world. Uh, we have cumulatively done about 25 billion trips. Um, all of that is data for us. And um, we have, uh, we've, we've been doing about 16 million trips per day these days. Um, and then we have 100 million plus active monthly users and three and a half million active drivers and courier partners who work on the platform. And then um, we have 20,000 employees worldwide and 3,700 developers worldwide as well who access our platforms that we build at Uber. And for Uber, data is very key. It's, it's the center of a lot of decisions that uh, are made, a lot of what you see, uh, the way you interact with the, with the app and how we operate as a company as well. A few examples here, uh, marketplace pri pricing, um, search pricing, and, and things of that nature. Uh, come from uh, data and then uh, models that we build on top of data. The recommendations that you see on the Eats delivery app uh, come from the data that, that uh, we, we have. Uh, and then there are city and uh, regional operations teams that use data to sort of monitor how, how a city is, is running, supply, demand. They course correct, they, they make sure the city, uh, marketplace is operating in a fair balance. Uh, the data powers compliance reporting that Uber uh, does in, in a lot of markets. Have used the data for both marketing and uh, our, all of our ML engineers and, and data scientists. They use our data to, to be able to build models to to figure out what are opportunities uh, that are ahead of us and so on and so forth. So data is the center of a, a, a big way of how Uber, Uber operates today. So before we jump into the specific problem and how we went about solving it, I will just give a history of uh, what we've been doing uh, with respect to cost efficiency on HDFS, uh, touching a few things around tiering and, and whatnot. Uh, Hadoop at Uber, HDFS at Uber. Um, so here is the, sort of the scale at which we operate HDFS. We serve billions of requests on a daily basis for more than 10,000 data users. These are, um, like I said, city operators, for example, querying the data to, to data engineers building pipelines, um, machine learning, model building, data scientists doing analysis and whatnot. Um, we have exabyte, exabyte scale storage at this point, uh, the total storage and the management on, on HDFS. Uh, across tens of clusters, uh, we manage them across about 11,000 hosts, a variety of server types and hard drive sizes, if you will. And data that comes into uh, the data lake powered by HDFS uh, comes from a lot of different sources, mobile app events, uh, device telemetry, or microservices emit events, uh, log events that, that uh, eventually land in the data lake. Uh, we have database change logs uh, that also uh, gets funneled into, into uh, data lake third-party data feeds. We also have bulk uploads of data that directly come and land in, in, in HDFS. Most of these data, they, they flow through a, a, a standard model uh, as event logs on Kafka, and we have uh, an incremental ingestion that then takes the data from Kafka and lands it into the uh, tier data leak. Uh, today, we have uh, three tiers roughly, uh, the hot tier, the warm, and, and archival. Hot and warm are powered by HDFS. We have a small footprint in cloud for archival data that we store, uh, largely cold data that we store for, for a reason that we need to preserve the data for, for a period of time. Um, just a bit of uh, time wind and, and looking at where we started. We started in 2015. Sort of, that's where our uh, first Hadoop first HDX clusters have been built uh, for Fruber, um, a little around that time. Um, we did what most of the, the companies were doing at that time co-located HDFS and storage for, for performance and efficiency. So we had one server type, again, you had a smaller footprint. 
which had, I think, 24 uh, hard drives, two terabytes each at that point, and uh, Yarn and computer co-located. Uh, over, over the years, we, we did see uh, our storage footprint was growing much faster than our compute. So because we were throwing the same type of machines, the compute utilization was, was not uh, the best place. So we decided to disaggregate so we can grow both tiers independently, the storage and compute. This happened around uh, late 2017, where we had uh, disaggregated compute and storage. Uh, we were unfortunately on, on a 10 gig network, so we uh, were able to manage through the disaggregation, not a lot of performance lost uh, when we did that. And then we observed storage continue to grow faster. Now that we have a storage tier, uh, our storage specific servers, we were able to go look at uh, storage space utilization, IO utilization, and things like that. And then try to look for opportunities to be able to push uh, cost efficiency further. And at this point, we also had a handful of clusters. We had uh, specific use cases that required tighter SLAs and whatnot. So we, we separated them into uh, specific clusters. HBase was one of those. Um, and then we um, also were introducing ViewFS to be able to manage multiple clusters as, as uh, from a client side standpoint. We had a handful of mount points, two or three of them, uh, if you will. Um, and then at this point, HDFS was also teasing single cluster limits, largely around uh, name node memory footprint uh, growing. We had one large cluster and a couple of small clusters. So you can imagine the biggest cluster was, is where most of the data was getting dumped. The name node memory footprint was growing to a point where it, it was uh, closer to the, to the limits, JVM. We had to do a lot of tuning at that point. We also were hitting the RPC latency limits, uh, so which pushed us to be able to see how we can scale out to support growth. So a couple of goals that we had, we were, we were trying to tackle at that point was storage tiering in terms of uh, uh, bending the cost curve while we continue to grow storage. Uh, and we also wanted to do this without any user facing uh, changes uh, as much as possible. And then uh, we also had to scale out our clusters to be able to support the growth that we were going through at that point and then continue to do, do now. Um, so we wanted to support a generic uh, multi-tiered model for storage. We wanted to introduce, let's say, one tier, but then we also saw that the need to introduce probably additional tiers over, over a period of time and also have multiple clusters across which data can move. Uh, so as a, we, we were moving away from uh, VFS to a server side mount points with router-based federation, which allowed us to be able to move data without having to change clients or configuration or client side. Um, a big question, I think, when we were uh, doing this was trying to answer, uh, should what we have cold data, we have warm data. So we did an analysis. This is about three years old. So but our patterns are similar. Maybe the percentage numbers are a little different. The reason why we chose to do warm is most of our data, uh, historical data, was, was getting accessed uh, and not a lot of cold data, if you will. There's a little bit of cold data, but majority of the other data was getting accessed. Uh, primarily, I mean, the anecdotal evidences that we saw was uh, Uber's business had a lot of seasonality, Halloween, New Year's, for example. Like people go back to old data to see how things behaved. Uh, so there's a lot of that uh, that happens in terms of why why people touch old data. But but then I mean, uh, it's not all the same. You do see a temporal temporal property in terms of how data gets accessed, especially the historical data. Um, so we were able to see uh, and find data that has. Uh, become a little warmer than the new data, which is hot. Uh, so we were able to find ways to be able to put them on machines where it's accessible, but then uh, do not have to be uh, uh, providing the same IO cap capabilities on those machines. We had a, a, a talk that we gave at a Hadoop meetup earlier. I've linked it here. Once the site's available, feel free to take a look at it as well, where we go into some more details on this. So here is where we are today, right? After having done all of that work, so we have clients, the standard ones, uh, Hive, Presto, Spark, Flink, and all that, and then uh, we have a layer of routers that uh, are fronting our Hadoop clusters, and these uh, use a zookeeper based state store at this point. They have mount points. We have about tens of thousands at this point of mount points uh, that that then route traffic to different clusters, as you will. And then we have a, a few HDFS clusters beneath uh, the routers. And each of the HDFS cluster is, is uh, HA enabled active standby. We also have an observer name node. Uh, an observer is essentially a, uh, a name node that's optimized for read traffic. And, and um, they are eventually consistent. So if, if uh, it's, we don't support read after write, uh, immediate read after writes uh, at this point, but then the community has capability to support that as well. We've not yet caught up to that. Uh, this is something that we co-develop and that's a internal version that we're running at this point. Um, and then uh, you can see a bunch of hot clusters today. Uh, and yesterday's talk, our colleagues also presented. Uh, we 
uh, are breaking our clusters into uh, um, capability based or a specific use case based, if you will, ingestion, ETL, and things like that. So we have a bunch of hot clusters now, and we have a warm cluster um, that is using um, higher density hard drives today. So we use eight terabytes uh, at this point. Our hot clusters are a mix of two and four terabyte hard drives. And then we are also working on an erasure recorded cluster for 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 one tier on prem. Uh, this is even cheaper than than the warm cluster that we have today. And we also have a bit of a cloud archival presence, as I said, for the cold data that you saw earlier. It's a small uh, footprint, so we didn't decide we decided not to build anything on prem, just to keep using uh, deep archive or, or very cold tiers on the cloud. We also have uh, a data tiering and a rebalancer service that uh, sits outside and then observes what's going on to figure out candidates to move across these clusters. Um, and this this essentially monitors the uh, access behavior and then finds data that then is getting tagged with uh, the hot or warm. And then once the candidates are picked up, it gets moved into the warm tier to, to save cost. And as data moves, we use the router to be able to set mount points to make sure that um, it's not users is not do not have to have to do uh, do anything when the data moves. It's all transparent for our users. Um, so, what has happened over over the years as we were uh, evolving is uh, now there's multiple tiers, but then there are also multiple server types with different sized hard drives. We see two, four, eight um, at this point, and we continue to monitor uh, the, the the utilization, I/O utilization, a storage. Uh, Space utilization, we keep it at about uh, 80%. Typically, and we are also pushing that a bit, uh, given that we have a lot, lot more headroom with, uh, with, with the footprint that we have. Um, and, and when we look at the average utilization, we still see an opportunity to push it further. It continues to lay low. Uh, given that we have grown over the last three years and, and the amount of old data that we have uh, continues to grow. Right? Um, However, if you just push the, the average by, let's say, adding higher density, what we also see is the, the tail latency start to tip. You see stragglers, you see uh, slow reads and, and jobs queries becoming um, slower. At least we, we see user facing impact. So uh, while there is an opportunity here and we are actually pushing towards uh, going to a 16 terabyte hard drive now, uh, we needed to do the work to make sure that we balance the IO uh, across the, the different types of hard drives that we have in the cluster to ensure that the tail latencies don't tip too much, right? So the metric that we, we are trying to uh, optimize towards is the IO per terabyte, uh, and then make sure that's even across uh, the different hard drives, different server types we have. And, and the other goal that we're trying to uh, get to is to not have different tiers based on temperature, rather um, have a unified, uh, cluster where, where the temperature is managed within the cluster and then move data around depending on, on the, the use cases and things like that. That allows us to be able to provide better SLA guarantees and quality of service rather than the, the hot and warm, uh, which we are going towards at this point. But then the, the experience of going through this has given us the expertise to operate high density clusters and, and whatnot. I'll, I'll now open it up to, to, to Leon to take us through the details of what we're doing to specifically solve this, this problem. Uh, over to Leon. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ikan. Uh, so we have a briefly uh, 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 talk about this a uh, little bit uh, uh, yesterday, uh, but today uh, I think we will go to more details and uh, uh, some other areas that we have improvements on. Uh, so first of all, the uh, uh, challenges comes in uh, when we are trying to um, uh, keep adopting the uh, better software, better and cheaper software uh, uh, hardware in our uh, HFS cluster. So uh, one thing we have observed in the last few years is that uh, the uh, for the HDD technology, the uh, cheaper and the denser disks actually appear on the market every year. So yeah. uh, back in 2017, uh, most of our hardware is like two or three terabytes, and uh, in 2018 we see like a four terabyte disk, and uh, uh, 2019 we see a eight terabyte disk, and uh, now we already have a, a sixteen terabyte disk from our vendors. So uh, and see the trend of HDD is that uh, the single disk capacity keeps uh, keeps increasing and increasing a lot. Um, However, in the meantime, uh, the the IOPS of a single disk didn't increase uh, that much. Um, so uh, from the last uh, past few years, it's almost just a, li a linear increase, um, and uh, which means that the um, uh, the IOPS per terabyte uh, on a single disk actually uh, decreased. 
Um, so in order to actually uh, uh, put all those hardwares inside one cluster, then we need to uh, do something to make sure that uh, uh, the user doesn't hit the problem when they uh, when they uh, when their query get uh, get into the sixteen terabyte disk. Uh, and in the meantime, the uh, smaller disks, uh, they, uh, the disk, uh, the IOPS is not uh, be, uh, being fully utilized. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, uh, and uh, also uh, for this uh, four type of hardware, so we have a uh, 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 we try to uh, um, maximize our uh, cost efficiency every year. So we try to adopt the uh, cheaper hardware uh, every year. So which result in that uh, in our cluster that we have uh, multiple uh, uh, hardware types inside our cluster, and uh, uh, even today we we still have a lot of. Uh, um, uh, a host from uh, 2017 that's uh, have a, a two or three terabyte uh, per disk. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as mentioned that uh, we have uh, so many uh, mixed hardwares inside the cluster, um, but uh, the current uh, HDFS uh, storage uh, theory model uh, only uh, consider uh, two types of uh, storage uh, for HDD. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, once you can, can uh, um, one is like a normal disk, and the other is an archive, uh, which uh, hosts the uh, uh, code blocks. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, in our previous setup, like Ikans mentioned, that uh, we uh, well, we try to speed the cluster, so we didn't actually uh, utilize the uh, um, the tiering uh, feature from uh, HFS. So we uh, actually copy the uh, data from uh, the hot cluster to the warm cluster once the data is uh, aged. Uh, so we split. Uh, we we just put the uh, denser disk there. Uh, however, uh, so simply separate separating in um, our hardware into two types uh, didn't uh, maximize our cost efficiency uh, because the uh, the warm data access is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, is uh, really low. That uh, eight terabyte, sixteen terabyte disk, the IOPS is almost uh, wasted. Um, uh, and uh, also in the future, we might have a uh, uh, different type of uh, more types of uh, hardware inside of our, our cluster. So uh, uh, just simply dividing the, all the hardware into two types is uh, cannot uh, um, maximize our um, cost efficiency. Um, right, uh, next slide. So uh, that's uh, how we come up with the, this uh, idea to actually uh, separate in the uh, one disk into two portions. Um, um, so we can uh, place a mix of the uh, um, temperature inside one HDD. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can see the picture here that uh, for four terabyte disk, we can just uh, put all the hot uh, blocks there. Uh, but for eight terabyte disk, uh, we we uh, we don't have to put uh, only cold uh, data there. We can we can put a, a mix of uh, pre probably three terabyte hot and uh, five terabyte cold. And for sixteen terabyte disk, we can put uh, probably uh, two terabyte hot, and uh, uh, the rest of the disk is just uh, placing the uh, uh, cold and warm data. So, um, uh, so, so uh, by this way, we can actually control the disk I/O uh, by placing um, the hot warm blocks on the same disk. And uh, um, uh, initially, we were thinking maybe we can just uh, do it on the uh, uh, OS level, do some uh, disk partitioning. Uh, but uh, the challenging for that is that uh, um, the disk partition is uh, pretty hard to manage. Um, uh, where we actually need to change the uh, this uh, ratio uh, based on the reality, or the, then we actually need to uh, re-image the entire host, and uh, uh, which result is that uh, if we want to do some small change, then we need to probably uh, um, do a, a huge maintenance on the entire cluster and uh, re-image all these uh, all these hosts that we need to change the this layout. So, so we think uh, maybe we can just do it from the uh, HFS level, from the data node level, that we can probably just control it by simply changing a data node configuration. Um, uh, so, so uh, we look at the current uh, uh, um, uh, uh, storage tiering feature from HFS. I think. Uh, uh, so we think that uh, uh, some simple change that uh, uh, if we can control the capacity of uh, each uh, storage directory, um, it will help us to achieve this goal. Uh, so here's an example that uh, um, how this feature uh, um, can be configured. Um, so, uh, and, uh, so so so. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a disk mount, a disk A here, um, and uh, uh, we want to separate it uh, to uh, two storage uh, types. And uh, the first one, uh, we can uh, the admin can create a disk A slash DFS, 
so which uh, which is for the like a hot box and uh, the other one can be disk a slash dfs archive uh, so once you have these two directions so hfs uh, uh, doesn't really care about the, the mount uh, for now uh, so uh, you can just uh, kind of put the the, um, the regular uh, disk uh, types in, in inside the um, uh, data directory configuration uh, and uh, what do we have added into the uh, HFS uh, data node logic is that uh, uh, um, the we can actually uh, specify the ratio of uh, uh, two uh, uh, two uh, uh, directories. So uh, the HFS will actually uh, start to detect uh, whether these two directories are on the same uh, disk mount. If they are on the same disk mount, um, and, and so this uh, reserve for archive uh, percentage, this uh, uh, configuration will yeah, be effective, and uh, um, the uh, capacity reported to a data node and all the way to a name node uh, will be uh, de decided according to this one. Uh, so uh, just uh, so uh, after we uh, um, configure the directories, we can simply add uh, one more uh, tag to uh, um, to show the ratios. Yeah. Uh, and also from the some feedbacks from the community that uh, um, uh, some some uh, some people said there are maybe the uh, in some deployments uh, one data node can have uh, multiple uh, um, type of disks on the same host. So, uh, for example, uh, maybe you can have a four terabyte disk and a sixteen terabyte on the on the same data node host. Uh, but the configuration will be the same. So uh, just one single configuration probably cannot satisfy uh, on the requirement uh, for some of the deployments. So we also uh, have some support on the um, uh, on specifying uh, the disk and uh, uh, the directories um, to be more fine-grained uh, configuration. Um, um, so apart from that, uh, the, the configuration we just talked about, you can also overwrite the disk capacity of uh, different uh, directories. And uh, uh, also, uh, not only for uh, storage tiering, uh, if you want to just use a part of your disk uh, for HFS, and uh, 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 and this this one can be also useful. Uh, so uh, apart from the uh, separating out the um, directories and the specifying the capacity in the data node, uh, another improvement we have done is that uh, uh, if you are uh, once you configure the um, material on the same disk. When you're moving blocks from hot to warm, um, uh, um, the HFS can also detect if the uh, two uh, if the uh, locality is uh, uh, it can we can use a uh, uh, simply a move to achieve the uh, better locality. So if the uh, um, if there's a, um, a directory in the same mount that is uh, ha that can satisfy the move uh, requirement, um, the HFS will just uh, do a simple move instead of a copy. Um, so, for example, here, uh, it, um, when we are moving a block from the hot portion from a terabyte disk um, to code, uh, if there's a capacity in the code portion, uh, we can just uh, uh, use a, or we can just create a hard link uh, to the code portion and then remove the in, uh, initial hard link from the hot portion. Uh, then we can achieve the movement without any data copy. So, this can can also save a lot of uh, data on uh, disk uh, throughput. Um, because uh, either way, if we do it in from the HFS mover or we do it from a DCP, if we need to move to another disk, uh, not on the same month, then we need to do a, a data copy and uh, uh, remove the original one. Um, yeah, in our cluster, the our data mover is actually very frequent uh, that we uh, keep uh, that we continuously keeping the uh, doing the TTL and the, the data uh, tiering um, based on the time. So this can also help a lot on the speed and uh, save the uh, this throughput. Uh, and uh, here's uh, some uh, result that we see from our uh, we're adopting the 16 terabyte HDD. Um, so you can see here the uh, the green line is the um, uh, the uh, the performance of the 16 terabyte HDD, and the yellow line is the uh, performance of the four terabyte HDD. So uh, the while the used capacity is almost a four x, we uh, observe the um, uh, the read traffic of the uh, sixteen terabyte HDD is uh, only about one point five x. And uh, in the meantime, the um, the new H, uh, uh, sixteen terabyte HDD the uh, disk uh, IOPS is a little bit higher than the four terabyte HDD. So. Uh, for the disk utilization point of view, we see it's uh, almost uh, uh, unified. 
uh, in our uh, production cluster, and uh, uh, they they actually uh, on the same cluster. Uh, so uh, eventually, um, uh, with this feature, we can uh, uh, achieve this uh, kind of uh, uh, zero copy data tiering. Uh, so, uh, so uh, as well, it can just show that uh, our uh, average DC utilization is uh, um, is not that high across the cluster. So we can, in the future, we are uh, think about adopting more and more uh, high density uh, disks inside our cluster. Um, so. So eventually, uh, we have a uh, uh, in our uh, cluster. We have a hot portion and a warm portion. So uh, when wherever we are doing the, the storage theory, uh, is it will just uh, simply be a, a, a hard link move, and uh, there's no copy uh, involved. And the in, and the new data will be right to the hot portion and uh, uh, being moved to the warm portion, and eventually being uh, uh, moved to the cloud archive, and uh, uh, all being deleted. And uh, for the uh, uh, temperature service, uh, um, it's also uh, very useful for us to decide uh, that uh, uh, which data is uh, uh, not being used quite often, and uh, which data can be uh, uh, can be tiered. So um, uh, in our case, uh, we have uh, uh, collected the data for HFS LSR. So we have the, all the directories uh, the information on the uh, of the HFS metadata. And uh, we also collect uh, our audio log uh, and ingest them into a Hive table. So we do a join uh, for these uh, two uh, uh, data sets. And uh, we get the, um, uh, some information. For example, uh, 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 if we can see for a specific folder how many access in the last uh, three months, we can get uh, this kind of information. And uh, based on this, we can um, uh, decide uh, which uh, folder we want, which uh, high partition, and uh, which folder we want to move. Um, uh, so we can uh, put those information in a uh, 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 data store and uh, uh, let our movers to pick up from this uh, data store and uh, eventually do the move and on the HFS cluster. Uh, and uh, during this, uh, um, so during our um, uh, investigation on the um, on the uh, balancing out the disk I/O and uh, uh, yeah, and also uh, um, improve our user experience on the uh, um, and make this uh, um, migration transparent to the users. We also uh, uh, we also want to share some of our other improvements and uh, learnings throughout the uh, um, process. So uh, first of all, the uh, metrics and the monitoring is the um, is uh, very important uh, for the large clusters. Um, so for for our of us, we have uh, multiple la layers of uh, monitoring that we have uh, applied um, to make sure that uh, the uh, data node performance uh, uh, um, is uh, is good. So uh, first of all, is of course the uh, host level monitoring. So we monitor the disk uh, throughput uh, um, and the network throughput, uh, which uh, indicates the uh, business of uh, um, uh, of the entire host. Uh, and uh, uh, for the on um, uh, um, hardware performance level, we we um, mo uh, monitor like a process blocked by the disk I/O and uh, um, the disk I/O utilization, uh, which is the time that a uh, uh, disk spindle is uh, busy. Um, uh, and uh, the process blocked by I/O is also a good indicator uh, that if you are running on like uh, young containers on the uh, on on a data node. Um, then we can see how busy is the uh, um, uh, how busy is the uh, uh, data node, and also separating out the read and write traffic uh, is also uh, important. So uh, we can also uh, we can we can actually see if the most of the uh, um, disk I/O utilization is contributed by the read traffic or the write traffic, um, or even like the balance uh, or mover traffic. Um, and also uh, for the you know, uh, high level or uh, cluster level, we use the uh, average moving average and the P99 to uh, have a, a one single metrics to show the performance of the entire cluster. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and for the data node level monitoring is uh, uh, also very important uh, because uh, sometimes the uh, slowness that the user experience for a slow data node um, may not be caused by the uh, um, may not be only caused by the hardware level of business. So, uh, for example, we see some uh, issues on the uh, that's uh, reported to uh, uh, open, uh, to open source as well. Is the um, when uh, um, uh, uh, when a reader thread is uh, reading a checksum, we will actually block the entire uh, um, 
data node the global lock. Uh, so in this case, uh, you block all, all the other reads and uh, um, eventually the uh, reads will be piling up and uh, finally the, uh, the users will see uh, experience the slowness. Uh, so uh, by uh, monitoring the data node, we can actually get the, those uh, level of information and uh, see where is the bottom that get. Um, and things like a uh, uh, receive account and uh, uh, kind of a stories on the, from the disk, uh, they are all very important for us to identify the issues. And uh, lastly uh, is the actual user experience uh, metrics. So uh, from the uh, client side, uh, we, we also uh, break down the kind of logic, uh, kind of read the logic and uh, um, understand the, um, the time that has been taken for each steps uh, from the client side. Uh, the, the HFS uh, read process uh, uh, logic is uh, uh, quite complex. And um, so, so uh, um, we've, we realized that we cannot only use uh, one matrix to reflect, uh, uh, to help us to debug the HFS client slowness issue. Um, uh, 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 a very deep breakdown uh, to each step is uh, pretty uh, helpful. And also tagging by the environment is also uh, very helpful in our case. So we can separate out the traffic of a, a Presto and the uh, uh, Hive, for example. And uh, we, can, we can even uh, get down to the um, uh, clusters because uh, sometimes um, the, uh, the client's slowness may be coming from the client itself. So for example, uh, one Presto cluster is quite busy. So it will um, uh, bring down the uh, uh, HFS read metrics. Uh, and uh, we're tagging it by environment and uh, separate out. Uh, we can identify if this is actually caused by the client uh, side issue. Uh, also, the monitoring on the HFS mover and balancer is also very helpful. Um, so we can uh, tune our speed on the mover and the balancer. Uh, and uh, uh, some uh, important uh, uh, features that we adopted that uh, uh, proven to be very useful um, to improve the user experience is uh, one is that uh, I uh, just uh, talked about is the uh, upstream bug fix uh, that uh, they are now uh, holds uh, the, the lock while reading the checksum from disk. And uh, this has been uh, helping a lot. And uh, uh, also the um, also sorting data nodes by performance is also uh, uh, pretty helpful. Um, so normally the HFS client will get a, a list of uh, block locations uh, in the order that's given by the name node. So uh, if we can actually, um, uh, in, so in the name node we can actually uh, do some do something that uh, uh, we can deprioritize uh, um, the bad data node um, in terms of uh, performance. So um, uh, when we are giving uh, when the name node give this uh, um, block locations back to the clients. Uh, in the sorted order by the performance. So the clients will always try to read the uh, first one, uh, which is a better data node and avoid the um, slower data nodes. Uh, so there, uh, we have implemented something in our branch, but uh, there are also similar uh, uh, feature uh, in, the, in, the, in the chunk uh, uh, as well. Uh, this, this one is also pretty helpful for us. Uh, and uh, 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 next slide, please. And the, the uh, last thing uh, we are uh, currently trying to uh, um, improve on is uh, the um, so uh, and now we actually realize that no matter uh, what we do for the data nodes in the large cluster, the slowness uh, probably uh, cannot be avoided hundred percent. So we are also trying to um, do some uh, kind of read improvements. Uh, so similar to the uh, like the hash read feature that's uh, already uh, existing. Uh, in the um, uh, open stream for a long time. Um, so so uh, if you're not familiar, hash read is uh, um, a feature that uh, on, uh, you, uh, you can time a read uh, of a position read. And uh, if the read is too slow, uh, you can start another thread and uh, do the uh, exact same read. And uh, whichever uh, returns first, uh, we, we can take that result. Uh, so, uh, so similar to this one, but uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the same feature doesn't really uh, exist for a uh, stateful read for now, um, uh, which is uh, um, a majority of our use case inside our normal read uh, uh, from Hive and Spark. Um, uh, so we, we are actually trying to uh, figure out if we can uh, apply the uh, similar idea to that. Uh, we can use a thread pool to perform the stateful read. And uh, uh, we can time the uh, one read operation uh, if the read operation is taking too long. Um, so we, we have the metrics of uh, the current reads, uh, so we know that uh, uh, 
maybe uh, if the uh, read is past some kind of threshold, we can uh, say it's a slow read. Uh, then we can uh, just uh, 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 stop this, uh, just abandon this uh, thread and start another thread to uh, read from the next uh, data node. So, so we have uh, three replicas, uh, if, if not uh, easy. Uh, we can always uh, try to fail over to a faster uh, data node in this case. Um, uh, so this one, this feature we are trying to currently trying to uh, um, develop and uh, uh, test in our in our um, cluster, and uh, um, and we have uh, actually met a, a bunch of challenges. Uh, the uh, it's not a, a trivial feature. Um, for example, the thread pool model can have a negative performance impact on some uh, um, very intense uh, services like uh, Presto. So from a Presto uh, uh, worker, you can have probably 40 and uh, 50 uh, um, worker threads uh, doing the, uh, uh, doing the uh, read on HFS simultaneously. So, um, uh, which means that we, can, we probably need a, a thread pool size of, of uh, 100 uh, um, threads running uh, in the same time. So uh, 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 in our testing, once we put that uh, threat uh, pool model into the Presto, it has actually have a negative, it actually start to take a more system resource from Presto and uh, uh, have negative impact on the uh, Presto works itself. So um, yeah, so uh, that's uh, something we are still uh, trying to uh, tune our logic and uh, um, probably uh, try to make it useful for all the, uh, uh, some other use cases. And uh, also tuning the parameters is also uh, very challenging. So, um, um, for example, uh, how do you define the read threshold? Uh, those kind of things. So, uh, um, it's uh, quite important that uh, we we don't want to um, introduce a negative impact on the client side. Yeah, uh, and I think uh, that's uh, that's it um, for today's uh, uh, presentation. Um, yeah, feel free to uh, um, ask if you have any questions on our slides. Hmm. Okay, I don't see a lot of questions there. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, exactly what we have experienced. Uh, uh, thanks for the question, Stefan. So, uh, um, so, uh, um, so the problem is that, uh, uh, first of all, the uh, client read is uh, uh, quite complex. Um, so uh, if we just time the uh, single read from the uh, start to the end, uh, it, might, it will not be sufficient for us to debug. So we actually uh, break down the, um, uh, break down the uh, um, HFS read logic into several steps. Uh, for example, so, uh, initially you need to get the block location from name node, and uh, you need to um, uh, 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 you need to construct a block reader, and then you need to then you need to uh, then you start to read the packages. So each of these uh, steps can uh, cause the slowness. Uh, maybe there's some network issue on the client side that maybe you cannot start a, a block reader. Uh, so uh, breaking down the uh, the um, client reader uh, um, uh, steps is uh, one thing. And uh, the uh, another thing is that we um, uh, we recently put some uh, 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 um, distributed tracing on the uh, on our uh, our cluster, and I think that that one is also uh, pretty helpful. Um, um, I think uh, yeah, I think probably Zhen uh, Zhen Shao has put something in the open source. I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, but the, the uh, distributed tracing can also be helpful that uh, uh, we can relate uh, one uh, slow data node read. Um, to uh, to us uh, to actually the data node. Yeah. Uh, do we enable HFS routing at the same time? Yeah. Or maybe you can, so you can talk about this one. The, uh, um, what we do today is we also have a pool of routers for uh, observer equivalent uh, on the name node. So essentially, we have a set of observer routers and a set of uh, uh, normal read write routers. And uh, the configuration on the client side is very similar to how we configure observer. Essentially, there's an observer name node, so similar to that, there's a, a DNS which points to an observer set of routers. So that's how we isolate today. We initially were thinking of locating, but then uh, the, the quality of service are, are separating out the, the read traffic and performance on that. 
uh, was becoming challenging. So we took a simple approach where we have a pool of routers for for read write and a pool of routers for observer, and then that's how we isolated it. And then the observer routers know how to route to the observer name nodes below uh, in the, the clusters. Yeah, I guess the observer router feature is only in our branch uh, before yeah. we put it into our nodes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, actually the uh, uh, we we don't we don't have a uh, we don't have that in the upstream. But uh, yeah, I think it would be good to uh, we can sh uh, share that uh, in internally uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, Uber we have our own uh, matrix uh, uh, library and uh, a system. So we have some uh, customized stuff. But uh, yeah, we, we can try to uh, uh, put uh, some more uh, fine grained matrix uh, to adopt in the open source as well. Uh, and uh, for distributed tracing, I think uh, um, um, probably I can ask the, our, our colleagues who actually did this. Uh, SSD or MVA. Uh, yeah, that's uh, something we uh, I think that's something we have uh, looking to. And uh, initially, I think for some of the like uh, super busy cluster, we had looking to uh, using the S SSD and the MVME. But uh, I think eventually, we uh, 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 still due to the cost efficiency, I think uh, we probably don't need it. Uh, uh, I think uh, as long as we can balance the this I/O across the cluster, then uh, we probably don't uh, don't actually need, need uh, to adopt SSD, which is a uh, uh, quite expensive. Um, yeah. Yeah. So one extreme scenario is we we may I mean if you push the the density so high that there is extremely hot data we may introduce, but at the moment uh, the the spread of I/O across all of the data that we have uh, at least allows us to do it without SSDs or in the NVMEs at that point, at this point. Uh, so we'll continue in this direction for a bit until we, we see a use case where we need SSD. But we do look at it once in a while. Uh, we do have SSD-based SKUs that are in use within Uber for other use cases, traditional online databases. So we, we do benchmark once in a while to, to see if it makes sense. But at the moment, uh, we don't see it coming. OK. Uh, cool, cool. I think uh, we are uh, probably out of time. Uh, uh, oh, I think there's uh, one more question. Uh, um, so I'll take a bit, and, and Leanne, please uh, chime in as well. Oh, sure, sure. Question is around, are, uh, do you use any open source tools uh, uh, for HDFS in terms of monitoring and, and moving copying data to disk? Um, I think from from a monitoring standpoint or uh, the temperature measurement standpoint, I think we use the the audit logs, uh, but then we, we do ingest it into into Hive table to be able to then uh, do analysis to figure out candidates. So that's a bit of uh, is nothing too complicated, but at the same time, uh, it's 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 a job that essentially that, that analyzes and joins the data to to pick candidates. It's a bit specific to to our use cases with exceptions and whatnot. Um, from moving standpoint, it's 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 a glorified CP, if you will. But then, it, it, uh, what we have implemented is a workflow that also works with the router to to manipulate mount point uh, to make sure that that the user facing um, how the data looks for the users does not have an impact. So that's sort of what we've implemented. Uh, we've not open sourced that. We could consider uh, doing that. It's a bit specific to how we've laid out our architecture, which is one reason why we didn't. Uh, but I think if there is interest, we can uh, we can uh, continue to explore that that uh, that that. Uh, and then for what what we've done in the I/O management uh, unified cluster SKU type things, uh, which is this other recent work, which is doing leveraging HDFS own tiering to to do what we want to do, and that's largely open source work. We we are publishing whatever we are doing uh, to open source to make sure that we can do this within this disk. Uh, you you have tiers and you, you move data around. We're using HDFS uh, data mover rebalancer type things. We're using the data tagging uh, feature available in HDFS to do that. Uh, so we'll continue to to, to engage and, and open source anything that we think uh, is useful for the broader community. Cool, cool. Um, All right, thanks everyone. Um, please uh, feel free to reach out to us if there's interest in, in some of the work that we're doing. Uh, we can collaborate. We always look for collaborators to to to, to engage and participate with. Um, glad. Thanks for taking the time to. Thank you, thank you guys. Thanks, bye. Bye bye.